Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to tell you a story, the story of the surprise social entrepreneur. Professor Greg Dees from Duke University tells us that a social entrepreneur has five characteristics. A social entrepreneur is socially driven. They'd like to make social change more than to create private wealth. A social entrepreneur is growth focused. They're looking for ways to scale and sustain their ideas. A social entrepreneur innovates, adapts, and learns. A social entrepreneur is resourceful. They don't feel constrained by the fact that they don't have money or assets in hand today. And a social entrepreneur feels accountable, accountable to their investors, their donors, and to the constituents whom they, they serve. Now we'll start our story of the surprise social entrepreneur. 23 years ago, our surprise social entrepreneur started a social purpose business. The values of equity and access are very important to this company, and for that reason, they've set their price point to ensure that their products are affordable. This company is also brave. They're willing to use their bully pulpit to take on controversial issues. In the first year, this company had a budget of $35,000. Last year, the operating budget was $12 million, and recently, the social purpose business opened a new manufacturing facility, so they, they've improved, they've expanded their production capacity by 700%. When this company started, they were the very first ones with a unique value proposition. Now, they've been popular and successful, so since then, people have tried to copy and mimic their work, but that's okay, because our surprise social entrepreneur has an in-house incubator, which allows this company to continue to experiment, try new things, and stay ahead of the curve. That social purpose business that I was just describing, the, the new manufacturing facility, that was funded through a public-private partnership. Government, business, philanthropy all came together, and this company raised $70 million of expansion capital. And in terms of being accountable, you know, I don't think I'm aware of another company that invites and uses feedback to make mid-course corrections quite like this one. This company receives feedback from constituents, from peers, and from experts on a regular basis. Now for me, when I thought about our surprise social entrepreneur and all of the things he'd accomplished, I felt it was a really clear fit with our, our criteria of what a social innovator looks like, but it occurred to me that not everyone would necessarily see it that way. Not everyone would see this person and the company they built and, and recognize a social entrepreneur because I think that in the social innovation space, we have a preconceived idea of what a social innovator looks like. We think we know one when we see them, and we think they look like this, right? So this is Jacqueline Novogratz, and she takes donated capital, and she invests it in businesses that provide goods and services for poor people in places like Africa and Asia, things like clean water and an ambulance service that will go into the slums of Mumbai. Those are the types of companies that Jacqueline invests in. Or this is a social entrepreneur. The father of microfinance, Muhammad Yunus. Here he's being recognized for his work through a Nobel Peace Prize. Or here's another social entrepreneur, Wendy Kopp, probably well known to people at Bennington. She started Teach for America, which has now grown to a global movement, bringing quality public education to poor people and, to, and invigorating a whole cadre of young leaders who care about education. Paul Farmer working on issues like TB and HIV and AIDS in difficult places like Haiti and Africa. Or Wangari Matai, who created a women's movement that focused on environmental conservation in her home in Kenya. These are all the folks that are in the textbooks. They're well regarded, they're well accepted, that these are our iconic social entrepreneurs. You know, and then sometimes if somebody's feeling provocative, well, they want to throw in a wild card, they'll say that this is a social entrepreneur. But I'm not talking about any of these folks today. Uh, and usually when I'm giving this lecture, I'm talking to a room full of MBA students or impact investors, and they don't know who this person is. But here at Bennington, I know at least a few people in the room <laughs> recognize Jim Houghton, who is the founding artistic director of Signature Theater and a proud parent of a freshman here at Bennington. But the MBA students and the impact investors, this is the moment in the talk when they get very, very skeptical. And they're, you know, Laura, what are you thinking? You're comparing some guy in New York City who runs a nonprofit off-Broadway theater company with two Nobel Peace Prize winners and a very rich 30-year-old wearing a hoodie. And I ask, them, I ask them to suspend their disbelief, and I tell them, let's begin and look a little harder at the social purpose business that is Signature Theater Company. 
So when Jim started Signature 23 years ago, Signature was built around a simple mission, to honor and celebrate the playwright. And Signature started by dedicating a full season each year to a retrospective of a single writer's work, providing a context from which to understand each play. Recently, Signature has grown into a new three theater facility, the Signature Center on far west 42nd Street, 70,000 square feet, a beautiful new facility. As I mentioned, it was funded through a public, uh, Frank Gehry was the architect, here's Frank in the yellow hard hat. And as I mentioned, it was, it was funded through a public-private partnership. Here from the ribbon cutting, you can see some of the partners. You've got Mayor Bloomberg, who was, at that time was the mayor of the city of New York, City Council Speaker Christine Quinn, representing government. New York City put $28 million into the Signature Center. And they provided a zoning bonus so that the private real estate developer related companies would host a, a theater in their new high-rise luxury apartment building. From the city's perspective, this was a way to maintain the character of Times Square as a theater district. And for the related companies, this was appealing because they could build a taller building. Philanthropy also played a role. And in fact, Bloomberg wore two hats, both representing the city and his Bloomberg philanthropies. The Pershing Square Foundation, founded by hedge fund investor Bill Ackman, also is a major donor of the Signature Center. And what's interesting is Bloomberg Philanthropies and the Pershing Square Foundation, they fund social innovation, and they fund social entrepreneurs, and they backed Signature Theater Company. Three theaters, as I said, a uh, office space, a studio space, rehearsal space. There's a 7,600 square foot lobby and this was very intentional. Jim wanted to create a community green in the middle of Hell's Kitchen, a place where people could come in, uh, use the free Wi-Fi, get a cup of coffee, browse at the bookstore, and spend some time. This theater lobby is not open one hour before the show starts and closes an hour after the show ends. This lobby is open 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And you don't need a ticket to enter. People are encouraged to come in throughout that time there's free musical entertainment in the evenings before a performance. You can sit down, get a glass of wine, enjoy the music. So you don't need a ticket to be part of Signature Theater Company. Jim wanted to create a situation for orchestrated collisions. There's one door to the theater. The artists, the staff, the donors, the audience, they all enter through the same door. They bump shoulders. They rub into each other. And part of being in that community is their experience when they come to see what's on stage. So you don't need a ticket to participate at Signature. But if you'd like to buy a ticket, you could probably afford one. Because for the next 20 years, the tickets are $25. And this is where Signature's value around equity and access really shines through. They use their status as a nonprofit organization to raise subsidy from governments and from philanthropy. So that the tickets that it costs Signature $75 to produce, they sell at the box office for $25. Now, I understand why when we talk about social innovation, people often leave out the arts. They feel that it, arts are expensive, which means they're elitist, which means they're not available to everybody. But this is an example of how Signature was able to, to affect that and make a difference. There were two great outcomes. First of all, the audience at Signature is much more diverse than at other theaters that you attend in New York. There are younger people. There are more people of color. There are people from throughout the socioeconomic spectrum. The other advantage is, frankly, Signature has a lot more visibility into its plans and its, its revenue. They don't have to wonder what attendance is going to look like quite so much. They don't have to wonder that if those seats were $75, how many of them would be full or empty. So by investing into the, in the future of theater audiences, Signature also made a smart operating decision as a company. Because of the expanded facility, Signature has been able to grow its programming. They continue to dedicate a season to a full season of plays to a living playwright each year, but they've been able to bring back playwrights from prior years. They've also been able to create a program for mid-career writers who embark on a five-year relationship with Signature. During that time, they receive uh, a health insurance and a stipend. They have an artistic home, and three plays of theirs will be produced during that five-year period. So Signature is investing in the future of theater audiences. It's also investing in the future of theater through its playwrights. Because Signature has realized its mission to honor and celebrate the playwright has revealed itself over time. The playwright represents all of us. The value in us as individuals and in us as we band together in our communities. Playwrights are a little bit more eloquent about expressing this and telling our stories than we might be, you and I. 
And that's why the focus is on celebrating and honoring the writer. But, you know, the topic of the talk, the surprise social entrepreneur. So why don't we dig in a little bit more on Jim Houghton? Now, admittedly, when Jim started Signature Theater, I'm not sure that Ashoka or Echoing Green or any of the groups that fund social entrepreneurs would have necessarily noticed Jim and thought he was a good bet because Jim was an out-of-work actor waiting tables. But like any good social entrepreneur, he used up his savings, he maxed out his credit cards, and he started to grow his idea. What was different about Jim is that he didn't just focus on growing Signature Theater. He invested in the arts community. He took seats on the boards of other theater companies. He took roles in the leadership of other arts organizations because he knew that Signature would grow if the field overall was growing. So today, in addition to leading Signature, Jim is the dean of the drama division at the Juilliard School. This does a lot of great things for the Juilliard students. It gives them some time to be around a professional theater before they graduate. For Signature, they have access to a great talent a pipeline of young professionals entering the field. And for Jim, it gives him some experience inside a 120-year-old arts institution with a large and influential board of directors and a billion-dollar endowment. So he's able to bring some of those lessons back to Signature. So every story has a moral. And for me, the moral of the story of the social entrepreneur is that it should not be a surprise that an artist is a social innovator. And I worry sometimes that we have this narrow perspective of who is and who is not a social entrepreneur. And we think that a social entrepreneur has to have an MBA. A social entrepreneur is necessarily going to be working in a field like health or education. A social entrepreneur has got to be innovating with technology or focused on the bottom of the pyramid. And I'm concerned that that narrow view will hold us back from making the social change we'd like to see in the world. Now, in case you think that Jim is the exception that proves the rule, I'd like to quickly describe to you four other fantastic artist social entrepreneurs. So Rick Lowe in Houston, Texas. Rick is a visual artist. In 1993, he started something called Project Row House. He was on the lookout for some affordable live workspace, and he and some friends went into the third ward in Houston, and they started to renovate some abandoned buildings. And along the way, Rick got an idea. He's like, this, this is going to be great. We can hold a mirror up. We can talk about poverty and illuminate the problems in this neighborhood through our, the art that we make. And he mentioned this to one of his new neighbors who said to him, well, you know, we live here. We know what the problems are. You don't need to tell our story for us. But if you guys are so creative, why don't you create a solution to these problems? And so today, Project Row House operates a community development corporation they provide housing for single mothers and families. They operate a community health center and a community garden. Or in Arizona, Gregory Sale, an installation artist. His recent work, It's Not, this, Not Just Black and White, was created with the help of inmates who are incarcerated for life without parole. And this installation has catalyzed conversations about the criminal justice system with judges, public defenders, parole officers, prison wardens, all coming together to have a conversation that they haven't been able to have without, be, without it being enabled through the art. In Portland, Maine, Marty Pottinger, she's a performance artist, she's a writer, and in 2007 she start, started something called Art at Work. Art at Work brings elected officials, civil servants, community organizers together. They make artwork together, and in the process, they get to actually know each other, and they let down their usual adversarial stances. And so what happens? Well, when the time comes and it's necessary, there's an open line of communication between one of the founders of Occupy Maine and the Portland City Police Chief. Or Robert Karimi. Robert is a performance artist, a poet, and his company is called The People's Cook. It uses theater and cooking to talk about health and well-being. One of their shows focuses on type 2, di type two diabetes in communities of color. So I've known Jim for more than 20 years, and I've gotten to know him a lot better in the last couple of months because I've written a case study about Signature Theater Company. And we have some copies here at the podium if you're interested to grab one after the talk. Uh, you can also find it online now at the Harvard Business Review. Working on this case study has reconfirmed my, my belief that artists are essential to the conversations we're having about social innovation. 
So the next time you're trying to solve a problem in your community, or you are thinking about ways to make sure our planet stays sustainable, or you're looking for an answer to a social justice problem, I hope you will include an artist in that conversation with you. So thank you very much for listening to the story of the surprise social entrepreneur. And now I'm very glad to introduce you to my friend, Jim Houghton. <laughs> okay. uh, thanks. Thank you. Uh, I've actually never been in the room when Laura has done <laughs> this. So uh, I saw it online when she did it, and she had approached me about this uh, a couple of years ago yeah. now. And uh, it's very odd, and I, I need to get photo approval uh, <laughs> next time. I, there's some photos there that are very scary. Um, yes, what can I do for you? So I'm going to pitch a couple of questions to Jim, and then we'll take questions from the audience. So please think of things you'd like to ask. Um, so Jim, there are two innovations that I highlighted a little bit in the talk, and we went into more depth in the case study. The first one was how you chose to scale. I mean, typically, folks, they go from a 99-seat theater to a 299-seat theater, and they just keep making the theaters bigger and adding more seats to the theater. But you chose to scale Signature by moving from one small mid-sized theater to three small mid-sized theaters. Can you tell us a little bit about the thinking behind that? Um, well, and I think this is somewhat unique to New York, but uh, one of the sort of drivers in New York is real estate. So, and, and the other piece of it specifically to theater is uh, there are equity contracts that go by 99 increments. So uh, you're off Broadway up through 499, and then it goes into a whole other zone. And with each 99 is another level contract. Um, and then at the very core is the mission. So uh, I'll talk about the real estate piece first and kind of the dynamics in the theater scene in uh, New York. You know, we have a saturation issue in New York in terms of just theater alone. There are 350 off-Broadway theaters. Uh, and if you think of Manhattan, that's just theater. You've got dance, you've got fine art, you've got all the arts that are there. So. Um, what, what happens, of those 350, there's about 11, maybe 12 mid-sized theaters. By mid-size, I mean anything over 99 seats. So basically about 330 of those 350 are 99 seat theaters. Uh, then you jump into this mid-size level, which uh, is the less than 90, uh, more than 99 and less than 199. So what happens often, uh, and then there's about five big guys, you know, have large institutional theaters. Um, what has happened in sort of the uh, arc of the development of theater companies, uh, they get to a point uh, where the equation doesn't really work for them. Where uh, You have one fixed theater, the mid-sized theaters. Um, you've got, at most, 199 seats. You've got one theater. You've got one calendar year. You can maybe do four shows a year. You've got a fixed income that can come in. That's then uh, the cost of making it keeps going up incrementally very quickly. Uh, so, and the ticket prices don't keep up with that. So over time, this ultimately, the cost ultimately kill the art. And if you don't pay attention to that, uh, you, you're gone. And one of those 99 seat theaters is slowly coming up. And that process sort of goes on and on. At the threshold moment where the larger institution, institutional theaters have found them their way or model that works approximately is that they've just added more seats to the equation. So the costs are here. Now they've built, uh, generally speaking, they go and build a 500-seat theater or maybe an 800-seat theater or they buy a Broadway theater. And now they've got more seats. This you know, gets balanced for a while. This starts creeping up. They get another theater that size and so on. So they solve the problem that way. So for me, one of the key equations, and this really is true with everything you've talked about here, is the intimacy piece is a very important factor for me. I want the artist and the audience to be breathing the same air. I want a, a sort of visceral, kind of informal, and, and maybe even not conscious, but subconscious event happening for each individual that you understand on some visceral level that your participation matters. So if you're in an auditorium that's less than 300 seats, you're going to sit down in that auditorium. You saw the photos of, excuse me, of them. And you can see that 
when you occupy a seat or you occupy space on that stage, there's just an understanding, a kinesthetic understanding, that your participation is effective. And so there's uh, a responsibility that comes with that. So that's sort of at the core of why I wanted to keep intimacy a key factor. So how do you deal, the big equation for me was, how do you deal with this threshold moment where you, you have to broaden uh, what you do, you have to expand and sort of pull yourself out of that moment where the factor, the equation isn't working. How do you solve that but still maintain the key values of your mission and the work that you do? So the intimacy piece was, you know, ultimately we landed in this uh, 75,000 square foot facility, which is enormous in Manhattan, especially on the art side of life. Um, we have a full city block. Um, but what I did is I built that uh, mass through intimate experiences. So no auditorium, that we have three auditoriums, really four. Uh, we have two rehearsal studios. We have one that morphs into a 99 seat theater because I wanted the full breadth of our community to be included, uh, our community in New York, so that we can host young companies, we can help shed light on them, we can have working studios that operate on that level. And then I have uh, a flexible theater space that morphs anywhere from 199 up to about 250. I have uh, that sort of fancier looking theater is uh, what we call the, uh, what do we call it? The uh, uh, Jewel Box Theater, sorry, the Griffin Jewel Box Theater. And that is a proscenium space, but it's modeled after sort of a European opera house, um, but it's miniaturized down to 190 seats. So it's a very dynamic space. Uh, that has sort of all the bells and whistles of the stage house, meaning it has a fly tower and it can do all kinds of stuff. But it's this incredibly intimate ex experience. And then our largest is the 300 seat theater. So we have those as the intimate uh, moments uh, where you collide with the work itself. And then one of the key factors is what you alluded to in terms of the sort of village green idea. We dedicated 7,500 square feet to public space. I made the front door the stage door, the staff door. Everyone has to pass through the same social space. Even within that sort of loft-like space, I've divided that into an intimate experiences. So there is a digital wall that you can play with and basically like oversized iPads that go deep into our history over 23 years of history into every season, every person that worked there and goes really deeply into each experience there. If that's your way in, that's an invitation there. Maybe for you, that's the digital. Directly across from that is this intimate bookstore, which I call the complete analog experience. You know, as you pick up the book, you'll turn a piece of paper and there are words on it, and you intersect that way. Or maybe it's that you just want to hang out at the bar and have a glass of wine and sit there with a friend, people watch, and so on, or some soup in the cafe. So all of these experiences are crafted in a way to keep things at a human scale. It's a pretty voluminous space, but we've created compression in the space. We worked, Frank Gehry was the uh, designer uh, of, of the space. Uh, I worked with Frank over eight years uh, on this project. And uh, he sort of fell in love with all of these principles and ideas. So here again, in the front of house, is this idea of what you borrowed the phrase of the orchestrated collision notion. So if the front door is the stage door and all doors, then uh, on one level, we're inviting our entire community in to intersect with the experience of making theater or whatever the storytelling or that digital or whatever experience you want in that lobby. It's on an equal um, level and playing ground. So there you're getting, again, more visual information that your participation matters. You're intersecting, that you've got an invitation. If your way into an experience is a digital way in, that digital invitation is the most and sort of door opening experience for you, it's there for you. And as are all those other experiences. I start all curtains at the same time. Um, we're constantly producing in all three spaces. The idea is that I can control as people come in the opportunity to collide. And I talk about each theater space as the space where the event itself happens. But the lobby space is what I refer to as the space that's trying to address the why we do you know, that sense of collision and wanting to have that moment together. N even if you're not consciously aware of it, that 
whatever way in for you that you do, you go, when we break down the event itself and you think about it in its sort of core aspects, it's, it's a little jarring to think that people gather that way. You know, that you go to a lot of trouble to show up at a theater and participate. So that lobby is about giving that information. And then the uh, flip side of that, the back of house is also designed for orchestrated collisions. So the notion is that we're doing work in the context of other work. So if you're on a particular project, you're sharing the same back of house with a rehearsal studio and another theater at the same time, no matter where you are in the building. So if you're that artist and you're in that production of Kung Fu by David Henry Wong we just did, and you know, you're coming out of the stage or you're in tech and you're going a little crazy or you're whatever, you're, you're, the tunnel vision is beginning to happen, um, you turn the corner and you're gonna run into Brandon Jacobs Jenkins, young uh, writer, 28 year old writer's work happening over there. And then the guy who's in rehearsal for some project that's happening next month. So that's happening back a house too, which again is sort of reminding you that we're a part of a larger whole. And it sounds very sort of rudimentary and basic, but those are the sort of core values. We started the company with this idea of honoring a body of work with a single writer in residence. And at the time, I didn't know it um, when I started the company that it didn't exist anywhere else with living writers, that you actually had the writer in residence, you would explore a body of work. And why did I do that? I was a young actor, I was a director. I had been in a production by uh, the writer Romulus Linney, um, and a, sort of a light bulb went off for me. You know, as the actor in that room, I had become a little disenchanted, frankly. Uh, you know, I had gone to school, I'd studied hard, I'd been working in the profession a little bit, and I had multiple experiences that were not particularly satisfying. And I, and I wondered why. You know, either I was in an experience where a fellow actor was, you know, losing it on, or didn't sort of lost touch with why they were there, or it was the director, or it was the artistic director, or their, the set was over-designed, or it just wouldn't cohere on a consistent basis. And so I felt like, what, what drove me into this to begin with uh, was one question as I got more and more disillus disillusioned about it. So jump back to my story about Romulus, I'm in a rehearsal room with him and suddenly, boom, everybody in the room knew why they were there. The sense of serving story in a way, in this case serving the storyteller, who in that particular case was also directing the play, became very clear. All the BS went out the window, you know. We, as a collective, collected around this particular material, we dug in to the best of our ability to get that story and dig into the given circumstances and so on uh, of that time and place and that we were exploring and so on. What was fascinating about it was that a, a harmless, simple question or a moment of struggle illuminated something in the room and then in that instant, or maybe it was the next day or a week later, Romulus would bring new pages in or he'd take something away or something would spark to a, a fellow artist. And so there was this sense of vitality in the room a clarity of purpose as to why we were there and so on that really turned me on as a young artist and reminded me uh, what I was hungry for. And then, so when I started the company with Romulus, Romulus too had been pigeonholed as this artist who wrote these Appalachian plays and pretty much that was all he did, which only represented about a third of his work. And so every time I would read something about Romulus, I would hear you know, that that's all he did. And he also, as an artist and playwright, struggled. He felt often uh, left out of the equation as his own work was being made and overwhelmed either by other visions that were uh, coming into play or he would be flown in for the opening of a play somewhere that was completely misguided when he saw it but would be the trophy writer for the night, for the opening night. Um, so. Um, all of that started to percolate and I came to the notion of, gee, if we did a whole body of work, if we sort of looked at the body of work and thought, what if we had the opportunity to do four or five projects together, what would we do and what would be the purpose of that and what context would we want to create and what would be the work within the context of other work? So all of that seeded a lot of these principles that are alive in the architecture of what you see in the building and the experience that you have. And getting back to my own personal journey, when 
I was a kid and in high school and starting to do plays, you know, at the end of the day, that, that was what I was hungry for, was that sense of the collective, the sense of a community, the sense of the power of the individual participation stacking up and you know, creating a sum greater than its parts, but knowing that every individual's participation mattered. So it gave me a personal sense of belonging, of, of having a, a greater context for my own place and feeling like I could give voice to something in my own little way, but know on some level that there was a sense of wonder that I got to participate in this large whole. So the key factors, and I promise I won't go on much longer with this one question, um, <laughs> which has turned into not one question. Um, it, you know, it all spirals together for me in that way. Uh, the, uh, you know, the point of that intersection of how do we grow this company, or is, is it time to grow the company, should we? And just so you know, we opened that in January of 2012, but it was 15 years before that it was first talked about. You know, it didn't happen overnight. And I won't bore you with the details, but there was a long, circuitous route. At one point, we were designing a building at Ground Zero, zero a performing arts center there. That's where we're, we engaged with Frank in 2003, four. And Frank ended up sort of falling in love with these principles, because they're, they're true to his work, too. I think these principles, hopefully, uh, are true to most artists' work um, when you cut down and cut through the crap. Um, so, uh, all of these things are alive in that building. So when we got to that moment, gee, how do we broaden this base? And the mission of the place was organically informing us, you know, of how to grow it. The residency you talked about, that single residency is called Res, Res 1. And the one where we invite a writer in for five years is called Res 5. And the writer program where they come back is called the Legacy Program. So Res 1 has been there since day one. Legacy came in in year 10. All the writers, we had built these marriages of sorts together. It takes a good two years, maybe as long as four years, to plan a season together. And then we actually do the season. And so all of them wanted to come back and continue the work. So Res 1 is really about honoring a body of work. There's always a writer, a new play in that. Uh, re the Legacy is about bringing back the writer of work and continuing that exploration and the relationship, and then the Res 5, again, conceived you know, 15 years prior to starting it, is about building bodies of work. So all the principles that are alive with the Res 1 are actually in Res 5. It's just a longer period of time. So you think of that as building a body of work, honoring a body of work, and once you've been through either residency, you can go into the uh, legacy program. And I often talk about, uh, you know, the plays are the byproduct to what we really do, and what we really do are relationships. That's what we do at Signature. And it happens to be relationships with artists that are known as writers. And for me, that is um, the critical place where we, this is a, an opinion, there's lots of different ways uh, to crack this, but from my perspective, that's where the work begins. It begins with the story. And when you're lucky enough to have that writer present in the room, when you can begin to understand that writer on a human level. And if that writer's Arthur Miller, you're trying to knock down the iconic uh, notion of who Arthur is and get Arthur in the room, the guy who's confronting that piece of paper every single day. You're doing that with every writer. But if you're doing a writer like Marie Irene Furness, who the whole world doesn't know, one of the things you're trying to do there is to say, Arthur Miller and Irene Furness, what do those two have in common? They belong in the same company. And so does Brandon Jacobs Jenkins, or Katori Hall, or Annie Baker, and so on. And these are all writers who have been with us. So all of those things were the soup, the stuff that was alive in this threshold moment decision. So for me personally, it made no sense to build large auditoriums one at a time and then try to change the programming to satisfy that appetite for more butts and seats. You know, because ultimately, I can't do the kind of work I'm doing generally in those kinds of auditoriums. You know, I'm interested in digging into the body of work and the misfits of that body of work. You know, often when I start with a writer, we talk about every single thing they've ever written, whether it's a children's book or, you know, a play or um, their well-known work and their less-known work and so on. You know, I generally talk 
through every project, and usually there's some agony and pain that starts to percolate and come forward in projects that just never found their rooting or somehow they, they were a, went askew in some direction. Um, I tend to gravitate towards those and go, what if we looked at that? What if we looked at that piece? I'm not interested in doing the Crucible, great play, or All My Sons, or Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, or uh, you know, um, True West, whatever. Um, I'm interested, and in, you know, I'm interested in doing those if we have real purpose behind them. You know, but I'm more interested in broadening your idea of who this person is, and ultimately revealing the human being behind the writer's name that you see on a page. And the, the last thing I'll say about that is, for me, I found Romulus again going back to our first writer in residence, often dismissed and easily so, because all he was was a name on a piece of paper for someone, and they had no access to him. And that is generally true for most writers. And I thought, gee, if we can actually make that a three-dimensional person that you have to actually look in the eye and have access to and see the pimples and the warts and all the great stuff too, then it's a little harder to dismiss that effort. And so that's where these multiples of intimate experiences, that's the acknowledgement of the individual participation mattering and giving our sense of, a, a sense of place, a sense of um, uh, usefulness. You know, I think that's ultimately what we all hunger for. And I, I know I do. Uh, I'll fess up to that, you know. In, in my best moments, I feel like, okay, uh, I feel okay about that thing that just happened, you know. I think there's a lot of time we spend questioning what we're doing and why we're doing it and how we're doing it and do I fit, you know, and, and so on. So uh, I swear I won't, uh, I, that, that, that's to give us a foundation for some of the things we're talking about. Uh, so go ahead, Laura, ask me I, the I second question. I think we question. should open it up because, so, you know, yeah, if I ask another there? question, we'll be, we'll be out of here. So yes, ma'am. So in our 15th year, we're in our uh, 23rd, we're about to start our 24th year. Um, so, uh, you know, I just felt basically with the onset of the internet coming on board, you know, our, my sister theaters and all of us, we were competing to uh, fill our seats. Generally, you know, we would offer discounts and kind of get people early in and then word of mouth and then you start running and it's okay. But we got to a certain point with the internet, then it became about how do you get in free? Everybody was getting in free everywhere. And we were giving our art away. And at the same time, the standard price was outrageous. So uh, the impulse was to do something about that, um, to make the work accessible. And we all talk about these programs. It's Tuesday nights, uh, you know, students or student rush at 6 o'clock. Or it's, you know, yeah, it's whatever package you put it around. But for me, I thought, what if we just make it all affordable? And we go after um, this in a broader sense and ask somebody or some buddies uh, and organizations to help underwrite that. So when we started taking it to that scale, suddenly that was interesting to a corporation, which would, you know, like Time Warner was the first one to help us underwrite that. Time Warner never would have blinked at us if I said I want to do Tuesday nights at 7 uh, for $25, that, that, they say that's nice, you know, but for a whole year, it was a broader idea. And then, um, so to jump to um, the, the key point of the question is, this is related to the intimacy, and that's why I went on about all that stuff. So um, my ideal audience at Signature is pick any subway car in Manhattan. I, like any one of them, in any line, I don't care what line you're on, and I want that audience. It's got every, you know, taste, sexual preference. It's got every economic sort of situation. Uh, it's got everybody, every color, every shape, every size. Everyone, that's why those of us who uh, live there want to live there, I think, most of us. Um, so that's the audience we're going after. But the only way you develop an audience like that is, one, you've got to make it accessible. But that's not the only thing. You've got to put on stage 
stories that are relevant to that subway car, you know? And that's a broad range of stories. So if I'm suddenly trying to fill 800 seats a night, I have to find the famous somebody who might fit that subway car, you know, audience, that, you know, pocket of audience that I want in order to get people in. The fact that I create this accessible ticket, so now it's affordable. You can basically go for the price of a movie, more or less, uh, you know, after you get your, you know, big soda and popcorn. Um, you know, and then we do writers and stories that are relevant to the, that full subway car. And so uh, it's the combination of those two elements that have really worked and broadened the base. And the interesting thing about it is so uh, we see every color, every, um, pretty much the subway car, you know, we, we see that. But that, that we've earned it, you know. There was a, a study done, Actors' Equity did a study on diversity on the New York stages because they could track that. They could track how many actors of color were on the stages in each uh, theater in the city. And by far, our theater was the most diverse by like 20%, you know, and it was significantly diverse, like by 50-50, just like major diversity on our stages, which then earns that diversity in your audience because one, you're putting the stories there, but you're creating the accessible price point. But the last thing I'll say about it, what's interesting is that the guy who can afford the $150 orchestra seat on Broadway or the 500 seat orchestra seat, premium seat on Broadway, or the $85 seat off Broadway, who's sitting at our theater for $25, is giving back. So there's all kinds of statistics that live out in the universe that are done by other uh, sources that over a five-year period of time, basically, um, I think it was like 2006 to 2011 or something like that, across the country in the theater world, uh, institutional, corporate, government, individual, and foundation support in the arts, and specifically theater, were either, in terms of growth, either at zero or below the line and at Signature during the same period and through our entire ticket initiative, all our numbers were up well in between the 40 and 60% growth during that same period of time. And I attribute that directly to someone feeling great about one, getting to participate in that event at that theater. By the way, the, the culture of the event changed overnight. We went from like, you know, uh, it, it was, uh, Basically, when you plop down whatever full price ticket price you put down, whether you're on a date or you're with a family and there's dinner and it's a $500 night, you're sitting there going, this better be good. On some level, inside of you, you're saying, this better be good. But if you land a $25 ticket that in a sold out auditorium, you're sitting there, God, I wonder, this is great I got in. It absolutely changes overnight. So anyway, so that dynamic is there. And that giving is there. And so that guy wants to give back to that. It, you feel good about it. You feel good that this is happening. And also, on every single ticket, it was critical to me that I didn't want to give seats away. It wasn't about free seats. I wanted to put a value on that. First of all, every ticket has the full price on it. And it has the math on every ticket. You know, that underwritten, X amount of dollars, you're paying 25. So the message there is you're getting a full value, and the value of this event is at this price. And by the way, the price point, those full price tickets of $75 and $85 pay for about half the event, and that's if every seat is filled at full price. So know that basically in a nonprofit theater that isn't in the larger institutional, huge auditorium, basically commercial model, everything else, they're at like the 70% earned revenue to 30% contributed. A theater like mine, and most theaters, if you're at a 50-50, you're, it's a good day. So for every, every butt in that seat, we're raising 50, another 100% of that ticket price in order to make the event happen. Okay, sorry. Is there a student? Are you a student? Yes, I am. Okay, go. That's right. Right. 
Well, well, um, that's a that's a it's an, what com, that's a sort of chicken and egg thing. Yeah. What comes first? So my my contention is that if you empower that writer in the room, that writer will empower every other uh, individual. Um, so if you take um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to some of the well-known writers in my head because there's someone you might feel intimidated by initially as an, a fellow artist in the room. So if Sam Shepard's sitting at the table and you're working on a play with him and you're at first rehearsal, you're going, uh, what, uh, you're not sure how to be invited into that conversation if, um, as, an, as an artist. But Sam, and really the sophisticated writers, and, and by sophisticated I don't mean by age, but the writers who uh, understand what their role is, uh, they empower everybody around that table. And one of the, the most usual phrases I hear is, I don't know, around that table. So when Arthur Miller says somebody asks him a long-winded question or they catch him at a mistake in his script in terms of the timeline, and he, you know, in, in the first he says, I don't know, um, what do you think? Boy, man, does that empower that room in an instant, you know? And when he gets caught in his own mistake and he teases the guy and says, you know, go screw yourself and you know, none of your business about my timeline, you know, he releases the room and then it empowers every individual in that room um, to work. So that's what writers really want to do. But um, to me, the, the, the story's the center of the experience. That doesn't mean the writer is the ego in the room. It actually usually means once the writer uh, releases back to you, it creates a very balanced room. And a lot of the BS goes out of it. Yes? Yeah. Well, you know, I'm doing my, my share, uh, you know, in, in our place. And to be honest, you know, uh, we committed to doing a generation of access, 20 years, when we opened the building. Um, because it's great, we opened this cool building, and it's terrific, and it has all these principles of life. But if you can't afford to use it, and it's free all day long, it's op the building's open all day long, lots of people are using it for other things, which is great. Uh, I think access is about open turn the key and open the door and let people in. You know, in terms of the price point and all of that, it's hard work. It's a, it's a $40 million problem I've put on my desk. And we've raised half of it. So we've got a million dollars a year coming in every year for the next 20 years. That's half every year. So we're scrambling every year to find the other million. But I know, I know and that sounds crazy that I'm talking in terms of millions uh, to me, and I, you know, that's huge and a big problem every year. But it is one of the key principles. This notion of access is key, and it's married to the building. Every square inch of the building is married to the mission of of the company. We have been mission strong from day one. We haven't veered off of it. It's organically grown. It's not like. We created this third program, and it's you know something we've made up out of thin air, so we can do, you know, one-off productions because that's we suddenly want to get into that market or something. It's it's all organically grown this way, and we have lots of other access points too that are free, from talkbacks to uh, we do signature cinema where we usually do films around either thematic themes that are around the plays we're doing or actual films that our writers have made. Uh, we have book clubs, all that stuff, it's, most of it's free, so you have access there. And if you have not a dime to your name and you're looking for some free Wi-Fi and a comfortable place to sit and clean bathrooms in New York City, on that basic level, you can go in and be in a cool space and be around other people and feel comfortable and feel taken care of um, and that you get a sense of belonging there. And if some, some point down the road you can afford that 25 bucks, you can get in there. And the other little secret is, is that I do let people in if they can't afford it. You know, I don't advertise that, but I, you know, if 
If I know somebody who can't afford that, I get them in there. We figure out how to do that. It's just, it's critical. Other questions? Like interference or them wanting to drive programming or, yeah. 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 Well, um, uh, I'm, I'm happy to say I have never had that. First of all, it's not like we have a long list of corporate sponsors. Although we now have, because we, we've grown the scale of this, we now have official airlines. So I can fly artists for free to us. I get coupons. And the airline is not telling me what we should put on our stage. They're interested because there's now enough scope that it warrants uh, the use of their philanthropic dollars. They've got to make every dollar count. Um, you know, uh, the first sponsor was Time Warner. Um, same deal, they did half. They never for a second uh, interfered with anything. And if they did, I would cut it off immediately. So I haven't had the issue, um, but I don't have it's not like I've got Coca-Cola and, you know, like I've got all these sponsors that are vying for, you know, wall space and, you know, we're not doing live TV, you know. The pressure's just, we've just grown the scale big enough to pique their interest as one of their small little endeavors, if that makes sense. Although, for Time Warner, that this was the largest commitment they made. They were our first sponsor for four consecutive seasons. That was the biggest single grant they gave ever uh, and committed up front to ever uh, because they believed in it. And they viewed what we did, and I view it too, it had three components. One was the civic piece of it, access being a civic piece. Education, uh, which for me, uh, the education piece is also access. You know, Give somebody the opportunity to be exposed to a story that's relevant to them, and they do their own growth. piece is obviously the cultural piece. I would just say that the clarity around the mission and values, I think, sets up a situation where people self-select to participate with Signature. So the corporate sponsors and the others who get involved, they kind of know what they're signing on for. And I don't think that they would raise some of the questions that you're uh, recognizing could be risks elsewhere. I worked for a ballet company at one point and there was a car company that was a sponsor and what they wanted to do was to park their car in the lobby of the theater you know, during the ballet performances. I don't think that a question like that, I mean, first of all, you couldn't get the car up to the second floor of Signature Center, but beyond that, I don't think that you would even be engaging in a discussion with someone who's looking for product placement in quite that way because the tone that Jim sets at the theater, it just never opens the door for that kind of conversation. Well, I would, I would say though to that is I think we have to be careful as artists that we don't get too precious with ourselves. Because I think, uh, it, you know, Delta Airlines wanted to, I, I don't, I'm trying to, because they're the, they're, they're the airline that I mentioned. I'm trying to think of a situation. Let's say a car company and they wanted to support the Res 5 program for a year, which would be to the tune of some crazy amount of money, and they wanted to put a car in the middle of the lobby, which they could in fact put a car in the middle of the lobby. Okay. Uh, we've had a car on our stages. Um, you know, I'd have to think about it. Um, but I would do it, the only way I would do it is if there was a sense of the preciousness taken out. I want to make sure I'm not too precious. I curate what goes in every corner of that place. Uh, but I also check myself to make sure I'm not uh, too precious about things. Um, so I don't know if I'd put a car in the lobby, but. Uh, uh, if, it, if there was something fun or funny about it and it didn't take itself too seriously and it was somehow connected to the event itself, I'd probably consider it. Not for the money, but for the experiment. So any last question? Because then I think we should wrap up. I see a hand way in the back. Yeah. Absolutely. That, that's a great question, and yes, we do. So, you know, like when we flipped the switch and we went to the, this ticket initiative, um, we changed the model upside down, right? The model I talked about earlier. It's like it suddenly went to, like, the lines were on the street. We did it, the first season we did it was our 15th anniversary season. 
and it happened to be uh, August Wilson. And so August's work is a prime example. August's work in New York had only been at premium tickets. It had only been on Broadway. And one off Broadway, full price, 85 bucks. And on Broadway, it was in the hundreds. You know? So uh, to your point, it was like, well, how do, you, how do you, now that that's available, we weren't interested in just making accessible tickets, a, a great theater ticket available to the people who already go. That's part of the population. Um, and we don't want to, you know, uh, we want we want to be inclusive of that part of the community too. But how do you go to the people who don't, even for a second, one are either even aware that theater exists, or if they're even aware, uh, have no funds whatsoever. It's not even part of the vocabulary. So how do you get to those folks? And over the last eight years, we've worked very very hard to figure that out. And that might mean. In August's case, we went to every African American church we could find. Uh, we went to festivals that uh, that were uh, well. We went to Harlem Week. We went to festivals in Brooklyn. We created church fans. And to cite a perfect example, I at one point uh, during that season, uh, there was a woman with a fan um, in the lobby, and I said to her. Um, well, where'd you get the fan? She goes, well, I was in Harlem Week, and she was 80-something years old, and she, it was four generations of women in her family, and she was the matriarch of the family, and they were celebrating her birthday. And she told me there that, because I, I introduced myself, and she said, under no circumstances could we have come to this tonight. And it was the first time they were seeing an August Wilson play. And they were seeing, I, I think they were seeing um, Seven Guitars, which is this incredible story. Um, they were just beaming with delight. And the smallest, of the, the youngest of them was, I think, maybe 10 or 11. It was, it was incredible. And that's what we're shooting for. You know, like when we have subscribers too, but I cut off subscriptions at 50%, no more than 50% of any one house. So that's my way of taking care of those people who are committed and want to come and explore. And, and we, you know, in our past, we did one writer at a time. So when it was the August Wilson season, it was the August Wilson season. And the next season was Chuck Me, and the next one was the NEC, uh, the Negro Ensemble Company, and the next was Tony Kushner. And so, you know, I, I sometimes use the analogy of soup, you know. Uh, everyone likes soup, but you don't like every soup, you know. So this is chicken noodle soup year, and you take off the tomato soup year. And so there's this sense of the audience always being new and coming and fresh to the company. And now all of this exists under this one roof. These three programs are coexisting together constantly. So we have the full spectrum of participant from our youngest practitioners who uh, my Juilliard hat on. I have, uh, right now I have, um, they, there are, my Juilliard students are in the center 20 weeks out of the year. I have the Columbia writers in um, our building right now. So our youngest practitioners, to our most seasoned practitioners, to the Everett Albies and all, and, and all of that. And writers who are in their 20s, in their 30s, in their 40s, in their 50s, 60s, you know. I'm doing a writer next year that's uh, in his 80s, and he's writing a new play. Uh, he's in the Res 1 program. An, a second Res 1 writer who's in her mid-40s. You know, Annie Baker's writing a new play. Annie's 31, you know. So we're creating a community one person at a time. And the basic principle of you walking into that place, my hope is if you walk into that center and you have any experience in there, that you'll feel some connection to it, that it's personal for you. And you might not know why. It might be the accessible materials, the plywood that's making the building or the concrete. It might be the fact that you see people like you. It might be that you see people not like you. And you go, wow, this is really, there's something vibrant about it and alive. You know, and it's, it takes the people to populate it, and it takes the honoring of each person to populate it. One of our screens is dedicated to sort of more of a social thing where you can go and take a picture. You answer a question like, what's your favorite thing? And there'll be like five answers you can answer. Is this something I would do? No. Is this something that at least 50% of our 
audience does, absolutely. And they define themselves literally in the moment. The audience, because it's multiple pictures that go up. And so as the night goes on, you literally see the audience making itself on this screen. And then it defaults back to production shots the next day and the audience gets made again. So. All right, I think we should wrap up there. Thank you for spending the hour with us. If you'd like copies of the case study, they're on the podium, grab one and see you at the next event. Thanks. Thanks. Did you get to the